Grace and peace to you in the name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, and welcome to Grace Presbyterian Church on this, the fourth Sunday of the season of Advent. As the pastor of this congregation, it is my privilege and my pleasure to welcome you to this time of worship and to make it known to you that you are welcome here in this place of worship. Anybody tries to tell you you're not welcome here, tell them they need to take it up with God because this is God's house. This is God's space. All of this is God's space. And it is God who says that you and all of you are welcome here. We have a few announcements that need to be made. First, I need to remind the members of the congregation that of all things, we will be having a congregational meeting just before the Christmas Eve service here in the, in the uh, courtyard garden at four o'clock on Christmas Eve day, uh, weather permitting. The congregational, purpose, congregational meeting will be for the election of elders to serve starting with the year 2021. That is the first of two announcements. The second announcement can actually be that day, but this is the first one, so we're doing our constitutional duty, so to speak. That does also give opportunity to remind you that there will be a service outdoors on Christmas Eve day at 4 o'clock p.m. in the Courtyard Garden between the wings of the Educational Center. This is, of course, weather permitting, and while there is some chance of rain that day, it's not a given at this point. If things change to the point where that's not feasible, other alternate arrangements or possibly just a cancellation may happen. For those of you who cannot physically attend services but have been joining with these services as they have been presented in video form, a different service will also be made available later that evening, uh, more of a full-fledged Lessons and Carol service, while the 4 o'clock service will be more of a straightforward evening prayer and worship service. So you have two different ways to participate and be placed into the time and space of the event of the Nativity on Christmas Eve. And you're invited to partake in both of them to the degree that you can. Also, I remind you that we do, of course, continue to take our Christmas joy offering for the particular um, needs of the Presbyterian Church USA, particularly ministers within the church who have perhaps fallen on hard times or have otherwise come into particular financial need. They are supported by that gift, as well as students in particularly historically black schools supported by the denomination or in other cases as well. Those are just a couple of the things that are supported by that offering. You can designate part of your check when you send your regular offering, mail it to the church office. If you go online and make a gift through the giving tab on the gpconline.org page, you also have a space where you can donate, or designate your donation towards the Christmas Joy offering as well. We'll collect that, well, as long as we need to, at least through the end of the year. And if we need to wait a little bit longer, we can, but obviously we don't want to wait too long so that the money can get to where it is needed. At the same time, we do continue to gather our regular offerings as well for the ongoing work of the church and the ongoing mission of the church as well. So I have to commend you over the course of this year, three quarters of which has been conducted in deeply unusual circumstances that uh, our members' financial support of this church has really honestly kept up pretty decently with what's been going on and despite the fact that we simply cannot safely gather together. And I must commend you for that fact and say that it will need to be that way for a little while longer. So I hope that you will continue your support and your prayerfulness and yes, your giving as well. And finally on that subject, if you haven't sent in your pledge for the forthcoming uh, church year, please do so as quickly as possible so budgets can be planned and things can be worked on as far as things like getting ourselves able to worship again and taking what precautions are necessary when we do so in person, uh, possibly continuing to be able to stream those services even when we do so in person for, so that those who have joined with us in worship in this uh, online time will not be left out when that back to being in person time comes. So we do invite you to get those pledge cards in if you haven't already, and I know many of you have, really as soon as you possibly can. It would be appreciated. This is the fourth and final Sunday of Advent. 
Our worship will continue today first with our prelude, the lighting of the fourth Advent candle, the call to worship and prayer of the day, and then with our first hymn, number 109, Blessed Be the God of Israel. Light one candle for love, because the world is broken and the wait is long, but love never ends. Love faithfully goes about the work of casting out fear, speaking truth, healing the deepest wounds, crossing the divide from the world to the next and back again. Here I am, she whispers the servant of the Lord. So we light one candle because it only takes one, Christ with us. An angel spoke to Mary, do not be afraid. The child she carries will be God's son, and the world will never be the same. God was with her, and God is with us, drawing us into worship and praise. Alleluia, let us worship God. Let us pray. God of what was and is and is to come, we would worship you fearlessly and in joy. Open our hearts to be ready and willing to receive your unexpected call to us and to respond in faith and trust in your goodwill for us all. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.
mindful of our sinfulness, and yet also remembering God's mercy and grace towards us, let us confess our sin before the Lord and before one another. Let us pray. An angel spoke to Mary, do not be afraid. And yet, O oh Lord, we find ourselves paralyzed by fear of what we do not know. Forgive us our sins, Lord, and give us the faith of Mary to respond to your grace with lives of grateful praise. Let us hear the good news that she first heard. Light is breaking, love is coming, the world is about to turn. Here in the waters of the font, this good word. The God who made a house of David is the same God who strengthens us and holds us in the obedience of faith, who forgives us and redeems us for his good work. Thanks be to God. Please join me in a prayer for the illumination of Scripture. Holy God, our hope and strength, by the power of your Spirit, prepare the way in our hearts for the coming of your word, so that we may see the glorious signs of your promise fulfilled. Amen. Now when the king was settled in his house, and the Lord had given him rest from all his enemies around him, the king said to the prophet Nathan, See now, I am living in a house of cedar, but the ark of God stays in a tent. Nathan said to the king, Go, do all that you have in mind, for the Lord is with you. But that same night the word of the Lord came to Nathan, Go and tell your servant David, Thus says the Lord, Are you the one to build me a house to live in? I have not lived in a house since the day I brought up the people of Israel from Egypt to this day, but I have been moving about in a tent and a tabernacle. Wherever I have moved about among all the people of Israel, did I ever speak a word with any of the tribal leaders of Israel whom I commanded to shepherd my people Israel saying, why have you not built me a house of cedar? Now therefore thus you shall say to my servant David, Thus says the Lord of hosts, I took you from the pasture, from following the sheep to be a prince over my people Israel, and I have been with you wherever you went. And I have cut off all your enemies from before you, and I will make you a great name, like the name of the great ones of the earth. And I will appoint a place for my people, Israel, and will plant them so that they may live in their own place and be disturbed no more. And evildoers shall afflict them no more as formerly. From the time that I appointed judges over my people Israel, and I will give you rest from all your enemies. Moreover, the Lord declares to you that the Lord will make you a house. A reading from Paul's letter to the church at Rome. We will hear Romans chapter 16, verses 25 through 37. Now to God, who is able to strengthen you according to my gospel and the proclamation of Jesus Christ, according to the revelation of the mystery that was kept secret for long ages, but is now disclosed, and through the prophetic writings is made known to all the Gentiles, according to the command of the eternal God, to bring about the obedience of faith, 
to the only wise God, through Jesus Christ, to whom be the glory forever. Amen. A reading from the Gospel according to Luke. We'll hear Luke 1, verses 5 through 38. In the days of King Herod of Judea, there was a priest named Zechariah who belonged to the priestly order of Abijah. His wife was a descendant of Aaron, and her name was Elizabeth. Both of them were righteous before God, living blamelessly according to all the commandments and regulations of the Lord. But they had no children, because Elizabeth was barren, and both were getting on in years. Once when he was serving as priest before God, and his section was on duty, he was chosen by lot, according to the custom of the priesthood, to enter the sanctuary of the Lord to offer incense. Now, at the time of the incense offering, the whole assembly of the people was praying outside. Then there appeared to him an angel of the Lord, standing at the right side of the altar of incense. When Zechariah saw him, he was terrified, and fear overwhelmed him. But the angel said to him, Do not be afraid, Zechariah, for your prayer has been heard. Your wife, Elizabeth, will bear you a son, and you will name him John. You will have joy and gladness, and many will rejoice at his birth. For he will be great in the sight of the Lord. He must never drink wine or strong drink. Even before his birth, he will be filled with the Holy Spirit. He will turn many of the people of Israel to the Lord their God. With the spirit and power of Elijah, he will go before them to turn the hearts of parents to their children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the righteous to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. Zechariah said to the angel, How will I know this is so? For I am an old man, and my wife is getting on in years. The angel replied, I am Gabriel. I stand in the presence of God, and I have been sent to speak to you and to bring you this good news. But now, because you did not believe my words, which will be fulfilled in their time, you will become mute, unable to speak, until the day these things occur. Meanwhile, the people were waiting for Zechariah and wondered at his delay in the sanctuary. When he did come out, he could not speak to them, and they realized that he had seen a vision in the sanctuary. He kept motioning to them and remained unable to speak. When his time of service was ended, he went to his home. After those days, his wife Elizabeth conceived, and for five months she re remained in seclusion. She said, This is what the Lord has done for me when he looked favorably on me and took away the disgrace I have endured among my people. In the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent by God to a town in Galilee called Nazareth to a virgin engaged to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David. The virgin's name was Mary. And he came to her and said, Greetings, favored one, the Lord is with you. But she was much perplexed by his words and wondered what sort of greeting this might be. The angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God, and now you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you will name him Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High, and the Lord God will give to him the throne of his ancestor David. He will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there will be no end. Mary said to the angel, How can this be, since I am a virgin? The angel said to her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore the child to be born will be holy. He will be called Son of God. And now your relative Elizabeth, in her old age, has also conceived a son. And this is the sixth month for her who was said to be barren. 
for nothing will be impossible with God. Then Mary said, Here am I, the servant of the Lord. Let it be with me according to your word. Then the angel departed from her. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So, here we are. Almost there. Come this Thursday, Christmas Eve will be upon us, and Christians all over will, whether online or in outdoor services or even drive-by observances, as I've heard some churches are planning, they'll mark the birth of Jesus in that feed trough in Bethlehem. The season of Advent will meet its culmination, or at least one of them will. Advent is, as we have observed already, a two-faced season after a fashion. Even as we look back and remember that birth, we also look forward, anticipating the longed-for return of Christ. Now, while it's not at all impossible that such a thing could happen between now and Christmas Eve, it's not something we can predict or count on. We've been reminded many times in Scripture that nobody but not God knows that hour. Not to mention, we've also been reminded many times by the failures of those who did try to predict those events. As far as we know, when Christmas Eve comes, we will still be continuing to wait for that second advent. The readings we just heard offer us some examples of waiting, both done well and uh, not so well. The account from 2 Samuel finds its place in Advent as a reminder of and connection to all those other texts of the season that point to the anticipated Messiah as being in the line of David, as we just heard a little bit in the reading from Luke. That house is evoked at the tail end of verse 11. This account also serves, however, as a good example of how not to wait upon the Lord. Now, let's be clear. King David wants to do a good thing. He sees the magnificent palace he has built for himself and at least has the decency to notice that the tent in which the Ark of the Covenant is housed is rather meager looking by comparison. David also has the decency to realize that as the king, he can do something about that. Meanwhile, the prophet Nathan, Nathan apparently without hesitation, agrees with the king's insinuated plans. God does not agree, however, and gives Nathan a substantial bit of instruction to relay to David, which might be summed up as, one, did I ask you to do this? And two, I'm the one who builds around here. However well-intentioned, David's plans were not God's plans. Now, this is an easy trap. We mean well, we want to do a good thing, or what at least seems to be a good thing, yet... It's not the thing God wants us to do. On the other hand, there are those who think that by their moves and machinations, they can manipulate God into giving them, oh, so much, whether it's wealth or power or whatever gets covered by that social media hashtag, bless them. Or there are even those who think they can hasten the day of the Lord by their political or religious or financial machinations. All of these things fail to meet the criteria of good Advent waiting. God is the one who initiates, and we are to follow. What, when God does initiate, though, it's our job to be ready to jump in and cooperate with God's action. This is where Zechariah falls a little bit short at the beginning of Luke's Gospel. Now, Zechariah served as a priest in the temple in Jerusalem, so you'd think he'd be ready for something to happen while on that job. But even the priesthood could apparently have a numbing repetitiveness to it. He is performing his service when an angel appears, and his first reaction is to be frightened. Luke says that fear overwhelmed him. The angel, who later identifies himself as Gabriel, pronounces a shocking thing. The old priest and his old wife will have a son, and not just any son at that, one who will be great in the sight of the Lord and will turn many of the people of Israel to the Lord their God. 
Zechariah's response, again, out of fear, is one of uh, incredulousness, to put it kindly, pointing out the kind of obvious fact that he and Elizabeth were quite old. Gabriel's response, which really seems to need a deep breath or sigh before it, is to point out that, look, I'm bringing this straight from the presence of God and to pronounce the old priest mute until the promise is fulfilled. Now, if you go to the end of this chapter, you'll see that all does come right in the end. Elizabeth does conceive and bear that son, and Zechariah, despite being unable to speak, does prevail over those who somehow had taken it upon themselves to decide the baby would be named after his father. Despite all of Elizabeth's protestations at that, he apparently manages to write forcefully, his name is John, and his voice is restored. And he gets to have his own prophetic moment, paraphrased in the first hymn we sang today. But that first moment of fear did cost Zechariah at least several months of being able to speak and to do his job, for that matter. Now, I've never been able to shake the feeling that Gabriel decided after this experience with Zechariah that he was probably better off going directly to the potential mother for these exchanges, and so next appears to Mary herself instead of going through Joseph. And Mary, as it turns out, manages to do what Zechariah could not. She responds to Gabriel without fear. Now, let's be clear, she's not unaffected by the event. Luke describes her as perplexed. And furthermore, it's not as if she doesn't have her own question for the angel. How can this be? But there's a way of questioning that makes it clear you think the whole thing is ridiculous. And there's a way of questioning that makes it clear that you're trying to understand. And Mary apparently found the latter. Or maybe Gabriel simply had more compassion for an uneducated, frightfully young woman from nowhere in particular being thrust into this impossible situation than he managed for a priest who by all rights should have known how to react to a word from God. Whatever the case, Mary's response is ultimately on target. She asks her question, but she listens and ultimately answers, yes, let it be with me according to your word. She then goes to visit her old cousin Elizabeth, sings a Magnificat, and ultimately in chapter 2, delivers that promised son. You see, all of the watching and waiting and preparing that we associate with Advent has a purpose. To help us be ready to respond when God calls us, or comes to us, or appears before us, or begins to move in the world. Not to jump the gun like David and try to do what God has not called us to do. Not to shrink back in fear and slip into disbelief like Zechariah. Instead, we listen like Mary. We may even ask questions, but we respond in the end with acceptance and obedience and readiness to do what we're called to do, no matter how crazy it sounds. I'm pretty sure Tom Petty didn't mean his song, The Waiting, to be an Advent song, certainly not based on the verses of the song, but the chorus does get it right. The waiting is the hardest part. Every day you get one more yard. You take it on faith, you take it to the heart, but the waiting is the hardest part. And so we wait, watching, and preparing, and so when that day comes and we behold the Lord's action in the world, we respond in faith and obedience. May God so prepare us to respond to that call. For the waiting and the being ready to act in obedience, thanks be to God. Amen. I invite you to join in an affirmation of faith adapted from the Confession of 1967 from the Presbyterian Church USA Book of Confessions. Out of Israel, God in due time raised up Jesus. His faith and obedience were the response of the perfect child of God. 
He was the fulfillment of God's promise to Israel, the beginning of the new creation, and the pioneer of the new humanity. He gave history its meaning and direction, and called the church to be his servant for the reconciliation of the world. Our second hymn this morning is To Our God Who Holds You Strong. This time we are called to pray for one another, to pray indeed for even our own needs, to pray for the community around us in which we live and work and move, to pray for the world and all of its troubles. During this time of prayer you were invited to lift up your own prayers of intercession for others, of petition for yourself, or simply prayers of lament or sorrow. As you, are so, as you are comfortable doing so, you are invited to leave particularly prayer requests in the comment or chat section that accompanies this video, if, again, if you're comfortable doing so. If not, you can certainly lift them up in the silence of your own hearts. Whichever you choose to do, you are invited to lift up your prayers during this time while this music is playing.
Gracious God, you know our prayers even before we pray them. You know our needs even before we know them. You know our requests even before we make them. We lift these prayers to you in accordance with your command and in trust that your good will will be done. We pray these prayers in the name of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, the teacher who taught his disciples to pray, saying, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Our final hymn is number 83, Come Thou Long Expected Jesus. to being able to see many of you this Thursday afternoon over in the courtyard garden at four o'clock for a combined congregational meeting and service for Christmas Eve. But I remind you, I'm not going to see you except at an appropriate distance, six feet apart at least, and without one of these on. We will not be violating those norms. We're not taking those chances. But we do invite you to be here the Courtyard Garden is the one between the wings of the Educational Building. It will begin around 4 o'clock. We'll get the meeting out of the way first. We can simply enjoy the service. Uh, there will be communion involved in what, as well, so I ask you to be prepared for that in a way that you probably haven't experienced before. Nonetheless, you're invited to join with us and to be prepared. If you cannot be physically at that service, about 7.30 that evening, the uh, pre-recorded service, lessons of, service of lessons and carols, will be available to stream just as these services have been on Sunday mornings. Whichever way you are able to participate, I wish you all that God wants to give you for this season of the year. And in the meantime, this blessing upon you, a blessing that grants to you if you will, the opportunity to be fearless, to be ready for whatever curveball God throws at you, to be ready for whatever crazy call God puts before you, and to respond in faithfulness and obedience. Prepare the way of the Lord. May the God of peace make you holy and the power of the Spirit sustain you until the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Alleluia.